part of the body, you don't have to think too hard to say, how could we connect those dots? How do we use that information to possibly find a way to make new cells? Here then is the plan for that. In normal development, you'll remember that the inner cell mass cells progressively become specialized or have their fates instructed to become pancreatic beta cells. Now, of course, not every inner cell mass cell does that. Some will become muscle and nerve, but this just shows the progression to one kind of differentiated cell. Because embryonic cells, embryonic stem cells, which I abbreviate as ES cells, can do that, I replace, as you see here, the ICM cell with an ES cell, because it could become any part of the body. So our challenge then is how to instruct this cell in a tissue culture dish to become a pancreatic beta cell. During this progression, genes have to be turned on and off. They control the differentiation and mark it for us so we know whether or not it's happening. And here are little pictures of the DNA chips from my last slide, sorry, from my last lecture, showing the progression. So our challenge is to figure out how to tell that cell at each stage what it should become. And I'm going to give you one example of how we discover the signals that are responsible for instructing these cells. We're going to talk about the signals at this step here. What causes this step to occur? The hint from this came not from any complicated experiment, from the, but from the simplest kind of thing a scientist does, which is to just watch, to observe what happens in normal development. And by watching the normal development of pancreatic beta cells in mice, my colleagues and I observed an interesting fact, which is that at every stage of their development, pancreatic islets seem to be right next to blood vessels. You see here on the left an embryonic islet where the islet is just beginning to grow. It's stained in green, and it's next to a red blood vessel there, and the other nuclei are just stained blue. As development proceeded to a mature adult, again, the islet is in green, and you see it's invested with vessels all like a spider web all through it. They're always right next to it. Well, given that they're right next to each other, we wanted to look at that very carefully at the earliest stage of development. And I'll show you a picture of sections through a developing mouse here. The cartoon at the bottom shows blood vessels. On the top are the two dorsal aorta. And then the yellow tube is the gut tube, which is going to become a pancreas. And the blue dots are the buds that will eventually make the pancreas. If you look at the left on section A, you see that the two dorsal aorta do not directly touch the gut tube, and there's no sign of pancreatic development, whereas in the middle, the blood vessel touches the gut tube, and we used a genetic trick to show that when cells are making their first commitment to become pancreas, turning on a gene called PDX, they turn those cells blue, and there you see, aha, those cells have now been told, we think, to become pancreas, and going a little bit farther towards the back, the, the aorta no longer touches the gut tube, and this gene doesn't come on. But that's a sort of circumstantial evidence. That doesn't demonstrate cause and effect. So a nice, simple experiment is to try to demonstrate that the blood vessel sends a signal by pulling the pieces apart and recombining them in a Petri dish. And that's shown here. Here you're looking at a picture of a mouse embryo that's been dissected. Those little balls, those little sausage-shaped things are called somites, and they're running along both sides of the neural tube. And we're looking at the embryo up from the bottom, and in the left picture, you can see peeling away a piece of the endoderm, the endoderm that doesn't yet know what to do. And on the right, those two little ribbons are the dorsal aorta, which have been dissected away. So we're now going to do a simple experiment of mixing and matching. If we take endoderm alone and put it in the Petri dish, we ask what happens or we combine endoderm with the aorta and ask what happens. This slide here shows that only when the endoderm is combined with the aorta is it capable of turning on insulin. That is, can it produce cells that are like the pancreatic beta cell? So this is a, a really simple experiment with a straightforward conclusion. The aorta is sending some signal to the endoderm telling those cells your job is to become pancreatic beta cells. Now, while we don't know the chemical nature of that signal, we obviously know a way forward to find it because we know where its source is. The aorta has this signal, and we'd like to now know what are the gene products that it's secreting to tell endoderm to become pancreatic. So the answer to the question of what causes this step is some signal from adjacent blood vessels, and it'll be possible to identify that signal. I want to 
now step back a bit and say, well, this is an example of how one moves from an undifferentiated ES cell eventually to a fully differentiated pancreatic beta cell. But we don't know all of the steps yet. We think we know how to go about finding them, but if you said to me, can you do it tomorrow, the answer is no. We don't know the signals for every step. This doesn't mean, of course, that one shouldn't try to find out how to turn embryonic stem cells into these different kinds of cells shown here on this slide. The neurons for Alzheimer's or the midbrain neurons for Parkinson's. And I thought I'd give an example. I, I talked already about the pancreatic beta cells, but I want to give an example where I think we know the most, which is in the case of motor neurons. How would one make a motor neuron? And this comes from a nice set of experiments by my colleagues Hinnick Victor Lee and Tom Jessel, where they've been able to take a mouse embryonic stem cell and turn it into a motor neuron in a dish. So this is quite amazing because it doesn't depend on letting the cell develop in an animal, but rather in a petri dish they can make a motor neuron. You can see that here, where a mouse embryonic stem cell is treated with two different factors, and then it turns into this bright green neuron you see over at the right. The two factors they used, which they'd been studied for some years, have to be added at the right time and the right concentration. One is retinoic acid related to a vitamin, and the other is this protein we talked about before, the growth factor sonic hedgehog. Now the amazing thing here then is that one can make a progenitor for the motor neuron and ask, could we put it in an animal and show that it has not just the morphology, the shape of a neuron, but can it have the function of a neuron? And that slide here shows that they took these mouse progenitors made from embryonic stem cells and injected them into a chicken embryo. The chicken embryo is shown there on the left in a cartoon. That embryo then developed into a little baby chick on the right. And you can see the cells were marked with a green fluorescent protein. And they made motor neurons that went out and innervated muscle. And you can see this at the bottom where the red and the green show motor neurons that have gone and made contacts with the muscle. So here we have a chick embryo that has mouse neurons talking to its muscle, demonstrating that the mouse ES cell can be directed to differentiate into a functional neuron. Now those two examples, of course, are not complete in that we're not at the point where we can take human embryonic stem cells and turn them into any cell type of choice. But the examples were intended to convince you that this is possible, and it's now a matter of working out the details of which signals at what concentration and at what time have to be added to cells to tell them what to do. Should they be a motor neuron, a pancreatic beta cell, or a cardiomyocyte? I want to finish up before questions by talking about connecting cloning now with this presumed ability to make stem cells to study degenerative diseases. So let me go back to degenerative diseases and remind you about why these have been so confoundingly difficult to treat. Degenerative diseases, the diseases I mentioned before where cell types go missing, are difficult to study because they're complex genetic disorders. It's not a single gene, but a set of genes that lead to the defect. Moreover, as I've already said, there's an interaction with the environment, and the environmental signal or signals in general aren't known. Now the reason we know that is there are cases of identical twins, so they have the same genes, where one gets a disease and the other doesn't. So that shows that it was the environment, their growth and development, which allowed for some signal added to the genetic background to give rise to the disease state. Finally, what makes it even more difficult is on the whole these diseases really only are well known and studied in people. And the, if the cause of the disease occurs many years before the patient appears in the doctor's office, then the doctor doesn't really have any way of trying to figure out what caused it. Was it that they ate cucumbers when they were 15 or they didn't eat enough cereal? What was the cause of a particular disease? You might even say it's all those confounding factors which can explain why biomedicine has not been very effective to date in treating these diseases. And so I'm going to describe a proposal that many of us think is a, an important way forward. And it combines cloning with embryonic stem cells. So let's begin by looking at an animation about how we might make an embryonic stem cell which contains all of the 